Yes. Yay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We'll be starting in just a few minutes, but in the meantime, I'll start promoting everybody from attendee to panelists. So if you do get a request from me, please accept it. If by some reason you don't get a request, just raise your virtual hand and I'll go back and promote you again. Thank you. Come on okay, do you see me? We hear you, Yossi, but we don't see you. Just a second. Now, now we see, see you. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Shalom, shalom. How are you? I'm okay. Thank Good you. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks so much. All is well. Yeah, just a second. Okay, yeah, now I'm all set. Yes. Shalom, cool. Daniel. We'll just wait a few more minutes to let more people join the webinar. In the meantime, feel free to turn on your camera so that we can all see each other and engage in conversation during the Q&A session of the election. I'll turn on the camera. Uh, when I'm finished my breakfast, if that's okay by you. That's that's amazing. Thank you, <laughs> Philip. So good morning and good afternoon, everybody. We will start in a moment or two. And if everybody could turn on their cameras, that would be great. We'll create more of a virtual community. Okay. How's your day? She yeah. on, she, I, I sent you a, a WhatsApp message. Mm -hmm. cool. Okay, so I'm going to start the introduction as everybody turns on their camera. Okay, so today we're, we're very honored again to have Yossi Shane with us. Yossi, in addition to all of his accomplishments, is a senior research fellow with ISGAP, which is you know, a great pleasure for us. And Yossi has been participating in our summer program at Oxford University for the last several years, uh, playing a key role in our summer institute. And last year was a keynote speaker at our conference at Cambridge. Uh, Yossi is the Romulo uh, Benacourt Professor of Political Science at Tel Aviv University. He also serves as the Chairman of the Political Science Department and the head of the Abba Ibn Graduate Studies Program in Diplomacy, and was the director of the Francis Brody Institute of Applied Diplomacy. Uh, he, he's also a full professor of comparative government and diaspora politics, formerly at Georgetown University, and was a founding director of the Jewish uh, program from Jew for Jewish civilization at Georgetown. Um, Yossi uh, did his BA in philosophy and an MA in political science from Tel Aviv University and received his PhD in political science from Yale, uh, from Yale University. Um, he also served as the head of the Hartog School of Government from 2003 to 2007 at uh, Tel Aviv University and the Israel Program of Constitutional Government, which uh, I guess, unfortunately or fortunately, seems quite relevant today. Uh, Yossi also held numerous uh, academic positions, uh, including at uh, Sciences Po in, in Paris, uh, University of, uh, sorry, Yale University, Wesleyan University, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and uh, Middlebury College, and was also a visiting fellow at St. Anthony's College uh, and a senior visiting professor 
um, at the Center for International Studies at Princeton. Uh, the list goes on. Also, Yossi played a key role uh, in the uh, higher education ministry in Israel and was most in the last uh, Knesset was a, a member of the Knesset as well. So he served uh, at the policy level as well as the scholarly level. So Yossi, thank you for being here with us. It's uh, always appreciated. And today, Yossi's lecture is entitled Anti-Semitism from Without and Racism from Within. Can we reconcile these instincts? Yossi, the floor is yours and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Charles and El Shaddai and all of the guests. I'm delighted to be here once again. Um, we are in a very particular moment, I would say, in Jewish history. What is happening in Israel in the last uh, few months, as I mean, has been um, really a change of uh, so many things here, and I would say impacting so many of us here and abroad, and cannot be. Um, addressed uh, yet in full because we are in the midst of an evolution or revolution. No one knows yet where we are heading. I've been, um, as Charles mentioned, I've been in the Knesset until November 15th, um, served as the, um, on the, uh, as the head of the Knesset Committee for Higher Education, and most importantly served in the uh, uh, foreign Relation and security, foreign security relation, the subcommittee for intelligence, which is the most important committee in the Knesset. Ever when I left the Knesset, in fact, I became this is news for you, Charles. Also, I just signed, I'm now affiliated also with Brandeis University because one of the things that I thought when I left the Knesset that we have to bring uh, American Jewish voices from the diaspora back to Israel, those who have not been involved. And I flew to uh, Brandeis in the invitation of Brandeis president, um, Professor uh, Leibovitz, uh, Ron Leibovitz and uh, spending time with Brandeis. And now we're trying to really to build Brandeis voice inside Israel. This is what I'm doing right now, in fact, as we speak. <clears throat> the lecture today is really related to the unfolding events, which have been so dramatic uh, in Israel and also to the theme, which is the theme of his gap about fighting anti-Semitism. The fact of the matter that we have to fight anti-Semitism from without and to fight for Israeli democracy from within is truly uh, a unique moment because it impacts our legitimacy. It impacts our, 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 our focus. What is the focus of the... Uh, uh, the Jewish state. Do we have enemies only from without or do we have, God forbid, rivals and uh, uh, some would go all the way to say enemies from within? Uh, are we into um, a fight in the international system against forces of evil that describe Israel as apartheid state and also uh, attack Jewish life abroad? while at the same time, we have to fight for our own life within ourselves um, among forces who are claiming um, to have Israel in one way and forces who are claiming that Israel has been taken uh, hostage by those who are now trying to make us non-democratic. This is a very important moment because the focus has been, um, of course, uh, domestically. We have not paying attention so much to what is happening abroad and also to anti-Semitism. We rather care mostly will we and how we will survive domestically uh, when we have such a fight in our midst. Some people have described this fight as no less than a prelude to a full civil war. And one should not minimize this internal bickering and fight that we have. Many people don't sleep at night because of what we have seen. And Israeli economy has been suffering. Israel high tech has been suffering. Israel standing security wise has been suffering. Israel standing in the world has been suffering, including, of course, our relation with the United States, our relations with 
uh, members of the Arab states in the Gulf with whom we signed the Abraham Accord, our relations in Europe and so on. Everything has been turning around since the creation of the last government. Now, I'm of course an opponent of this government, but I'm trying for a second to zoom out and not just to position myself vis-a-vis -vis this government. I think objectively speaking, and everybody will recognize this from the prime minister down, from the government down, we are in the midst of a huge crisis that everybody describes as the crisis that it perhaps is unparalleled. Some people say to 1948, some people compare it to 1973, the Yom Kippur War, which are now, uh, being, we are marking it as a 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. So this is where we are. And that's the nature of my talk because the fight against anti-Semitism abroad, against enemies of the Jews, against rivals of the Jews all around, is certainly being impacted by what is happening here and, um, and will continue to impact what is happening here. Some of our external enemies are drawing on the internal strife. This has always been the case with the Jews. Keep in mind that the Jews have always had rivalries in their midst when they had sovereignty, be it in the first temple era, be it in the second temple era. In fact, the Jews have always kind of claimed that their downfall of the second uh, uh, temple era and also the split between Judea and Israel in the first temple era has been because of internal bickering, not only by external forces. This is quite saddening to some, but this is the reality where we are now. And um, we have not seen um, yet the full picture. It's gonna be, I, I hope, clarified in the next few weeks. Um, and hopefully it will not deteriorate more than it has been deteriorating so fast in the last three months. Let me give you a short introduction, just a quick introduction, why it has been deteriorating so fast. In the election of November 1st, 2022, a new coalition emerged this coalition consists of the winning party of Likud under Netanyahu, which combined forces with the ultra-Orthodox forces on both what they call the Ashkenazi and Mizrahi ultra-Orthodox forces, plus the religious Zionist extremists of Mr. Smotrich and Mr. Bengvir. They were able to form a 64-member majority coalition against the opposition, which consists completely of 56 out of which um, almost, almost 10 or less are Arabs, so they're not counted. So basically they have a very, very strong majority victory. This majority victory, which gave Netanyahu and his coalition a big mandate to govern, has been quickly translated into a victory to claim a shift in Israeli values and Israeli uh, basic principles, a shift in the concept of Zionist and modernity, Zionism and modernity, a shift on issues pertaining to religion and state, all of which have been, have been uh, translated into legislations. The coalition government has decided to shift the legal system of Israel mm -hmm. and to enable and to empower the government, and of course, the government is the parliament also because of our system, the parliament is controlled by the government. To have the government and the parliament as it is right now with the majority of the, of the, of the Likud and the ultra-Orthodox and the re religious Zionist extremists um, into uh, the arm of Israel that will dictate new values by using new legislations. They rushed to introduce new legislations, hoping to introduce them not only in the committees of the Knesset, but bring them to the full chamber. And by so doing, to revolutionize the legal system that will undercut the position of the Supreme Court, which has been perceived by most of the coalition members as hostile to their values. Supreme Court perceived to be too activist, 
too liberal, too um, anti-Netanyahu, too anti-ultra-Orthodox, and they wanted to change the laws that will undercut judicial review of the Supreme Court, will change the judges on the Supreme Court and will introduce political judges, will change the role of the Attorney General who has been very strong in Israel because it's not only the Attorney General is also, is not only representative the representing the government, is also the Chief Prosecutor. This is how the job it is. And many people almost instinctively felt that this is an assault on the entire system and also the values that the society was created with an assault also on Israel's declaration of independence. We have been undergoing a demographic shift in Israel in the last few decades that is bringing very fast the balance of the Jewish state, that the ultra-Orthodox will gain more and more power from the simple reason that ultra-Orthodox families on average have almost seven and a half kids. And if you, just to give you an example, a 74-year-old ultra-Orthodox man will have on average 58 offsprings, while a, while a secular, what we call a secular or a, a liberal Israeli will have at best eight or nine. This is the, uh, this is the difference. And this is growing in, in lips and bounds forward, almost a geometrical growth that will change the nature of Israel because Netanyahu understands that this will give him a majority under the banner of majority coalition, they wanted to change the laws. While other Israelis are arguing that they cannot change the laws of because of the majority, and they cannot change what we call our constitutional arrangements. But we don't have a constitution. We have a constitution, we have only basic laws. So the ability to change the laws will basically change our constitutional arrangements, including, of course, Israel's Declaration of Independence, which enshrines civil rights, which enshrines the um, position of, of minorities, which enshrines the, um, the notion of modernity and Zionism, which enshrines not separation of state and religion, but a kind of a religion that has a religion as a civic religion rather than as practices. We're now coming, for example, to Passover, one of the laws which were passed just a week ago uh, by the Knesset was that no one can bring uh, leavened brand, unleavened brand to hospitals. Um, and they will, they will uh, search if you bring unleavened bread. Some people see this is, as a total infringement on uh, privacy, total infringement on um, uh, rights of citizens and so on and so forth. This is just a small example of what is happening. This has caused an uproar in Israel. The demonstrations here are on a weekly basis, sometimes on a daily basis, and the country basically shut down. Many in the high-tech business, military people, military personnel, uh, and, and especially pilots and, and warriors and so on, declared that if this will continue and we are going into the path of what they consider to be a dictatorship rather than uh, uh, a democracy, comparing it to Poland and Hungary, they will refuse to volunteer and serve as in the reserve unit, which they are now serving on a weekly basis. The crisis is immense, and the evolution of the crisis is not yet uh, seen. The uh, I would say the apex of the, but right now Netanyahu took a step back after he saw the the the. Uh, the uh, uh, results of this crisis, especially in the economy and the international sphere. And now they are negotiating during the uh, holiday of Pesach and before the, uh, uh, the, the Yom Atzma'ud, the Independence Day, uh, Yom HaShoah, which is we are marking also after Passover, and of course, remember, Remembrance Day. This is where we are. This is all without discussing at all the issues of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism at the same time has been growing, especially in the West, but not only, <clears throat> because of a variety of other reasons. 
may, some of these reasons relate to the evolution, for example, of American Jewry or to the position of French Jewry or British Jewry, or for example, because of heightened rhetoric, which came on the hill of the war between Russia and Ukraine, and also heightened rhetoric, uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric. So these are the conditions in which we are now placed. Within the Israeli system, of course, the existence of the religious Zionist extremists who are basically adopting racist language vis-a-vis -vis Arabs and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other uh, Israelis and also are hostile to the very fabric of a liberal society, also have raised questions about whether this legal system that they're trying to enshrine will lead to a more racist Israelis, while others condemning Israel's abroad as apartheid state because of the treatment of Palestinians, suddenly we got a different problem of Israel. Domestically, people are, are, are charging that the forces in the government are creating a more racial kind of a, a state, or at least trying to advance um, racial values in the state. So this is a huge crisis and one should not minimize this crisis. Um, that's where we are. Um, if we look at this picture, one asks oneself, what do we do? Because ISGAP and other organizations who are fighting anti-Semitism, and I myself who have been running for the last three or four decades, fighting uh, the uh, BDS or fighting all the nemesis of Israel and uh, world Jewry, suddenly find ourselves having to uh, contend with the domestic events and outside events and how to reconcile this. How do we sell our state? How do we defend? Part of our defense of the Israeli state has always been that we are the most democratic society, of course, in the Middle East, that Israel is, is a liberal society, that Israel has a separation of, of, of uh, branches of government, that we have the most advanced Supreme Court, the most liberal Supreme Court. This is what we had during the crisis of the Marmara. This is what we had the crisis in the war in Gaza. The Supreme Court could always defend Israel in the international arena. And once we are breaking this uh, 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 defense or this umbrella of legitimacy, uh, we will be exposed. Many soldiers felt they will be exposed without the Israeli Supreme Court. So this is, I would say, a double assault on what is perceived to be the Jewish people in Israel. This brings perhaps opportunities. For the first time, Israelis have been awakened to a direct assault on their life, perhaps much earlier than they thought, because this, some people have predicted it, uh, including myself in my book, The Israeli Century, but we have predicted it kind of like it will take some time before the demography will shift. But lo and behold, the demography did not shift fully, but the coalitions has empowered the political religious parties to be so strong because of also another issue because of Netanyahu has been uh, involved and has been entangled in charges of corruption vis-a-vis -vis the courts. And maybe people say, because of these charges, he's fighting the court so he will not be uh, eventually condemned or he's already been indicted or convicted of uh, criminal charges that has been brought against him by the attorney general whom he now want to discharge. So you can see maybe it's a complicated picture, but this picture has been uh, really racking the boat in Israel. The, the, uh, the early results, as I said, are abysmal. All the reports of the OECD, all the ranking uh, agencies uh, of, of, on, the, on, on the economy, hundreds of economists are warning us against the devastation that will befell Israel because of it, the, uh, 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 the losses, uh, in the international system, et cetera, et cetera. I've already enumerated all those risks that are involved. In addition, in the top of, of, of course, is the, the wrangling in the society and the fact that the kinship ties, the idea that we are all Jews, that the idea that we are all brothers and sisters, that we are responsible for each other is being eroded fast, up to the point that people are even threatening that during Remembrance Day, Member, people who lost their children, who lost their parents in the war 
will not be able to mourn together the day that Israelis have always come together, albeit the old Orthodox never accepted the tenets of the state, but basically the uh, Remembrance Day and Independence Day were always a cause of celebration. So the mood is very somber. So this is a big challenge. And I think one now has to understand how to deal with it. I think that also for the first time, we are also witnessing a growth in anti-Semitism of what we call of the older nature. Anti-Semitism, which is hostility toward Jews because they are Jewish. We saw in the United States what is happening. We saw with attacks on synagogues, we saw expressions, we saw the rise of anti-Semitism that is related to shifts in American society to rise of extreme forces, perhaps on the right. During the Trump era, we saw some of these expressions. And on the left, on the issue of the forces of progressive uh, forces in, in Europe, we saw like with Corbyn in Britain that are hostile to the Jews, not because of Israel, but because of their hatred of the Jews or the Jewish conspiracy or the global conspiracy, whatever you want. All those came together while before Israel could give an umbrella and support against the fight uh, against anti-Semitism. Now we have been kind of exposed to fights against anti-Semitism in the diaspora and the fights that Israel is fighting amongst itself. I think this is, again, a very tricky business for us to deal with. And it's a very tricky business to deal with for ISGAP. How do we divide our attention? What do we focus on? Because the fight against anti-Semitism always required the idea of us versus them. The idea that we know who is the enemy and who is us. If they hate us, so uh, we know who is our enemy. But if some will argue that the enemy is in our midst, God forbid, or we are divided internally, how could we assemble all our forces and fight the dangers of anti-Semitism? Second point, to what extent the enemies of Israel, or perhaps those who have, uh, 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 I would say, uh, wishing the Jews uh, all, the, uh, all, all the, the curses that one can imagine, are then being nourished by these internal struggles that we are, uh, fight, uh, we are now fighting amongst ourselves, undoubtedly. Many people are worrying that our enemies are now sitting, watching, and in fact, are uh, smiling and are saying, look, they're going to destroy themselves. The same way, perhaps some people say, we have caused our destruction during the Second Temple era when brothers fought against brothers. Very dangerous moments, as I say. It puts many of us scholars and thinkers and activists uh, thinking about those issues, try to set priorities to see how we can contend with them, what should we emphasize, what should we minimize, how we come together again, can we bring the forces again? I, for myself, think that this is the time for every Jew to stand and speak and become engaged. For a long time, for example, the forces in Israel that have been hostile to the Supreme Court have come from within with all kinds of theories and explanation, also good reasons. I was among those. Good. He's in his office. Go find Daba. Take your one. Guy? Guy? So, Daphne, could you mute everybody, please? We should be good now. Okay, cool. Sorry. Okay. I, for example, also had criticism I... against the Supreme Court for stepping its bound, for being too activist from time to time. But the question is right now is not whether the Supreme Court should perhaps uh, restrain itself or limit its judicial review and not become activist so, so much in deciding for the politicians, but whether we will have a Supreme Court as division of branches required. Let me explain something about the division of bra branches that some people do not understand. In the United States, for example, you have a constitution. You have, of course, um, three branches. You have the legislator, uh, the Congress, and the Senate, who is the Senate sort of uh, an upper hand in terms of legislation. 
Uh, and you have the executive, the president with tremendous powers, but you have an incredible Supreme Court, even though the Supreme Court is elected by the presidents, but is elected for life. Secondly, um, presidents have time limits for two terms. And third, of course, even when the Supreme Court seems to be uh, tilting into one side, let's say now with the decision Roe v. Wade, still there are forces that are balancing this by the state Supreme Courts or the state system, the federal system. We in the parliamentary system have a government built on coalition, as I explained. The coalition consists of all the parties that are supporting the government. Members of the Knesset, who are supposed to be and the legislator, are in fact completely dependent on the government and the ministers. And they will never vote against the government or the ministers. This will be unique. So in many ways, in many ways, the government and the Knesset are one. I served in the Knesset, and we know if you don't vote against, if you vote against your own government, it's it's rare. You will never do so. You'll be, be basically very disciplined to keep the government intact. Otherwise, you'll bring the government downfall. That would happen to the Bennett government. The Bennett government lost its footing when two members of the coalition voted against it, and that was it for it. Uh, so this stands vis-a-vis -vis the court. The court is the is the other is is the other pillar as the uh, judiciary, but if the judiciary falls, people worry we will have only one arm and the government will control, and the propensity of the government plus the propensity of the religious extremists to change their values will 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 create a semi-authoritarian state. That's what they worry about, including undercutting many of the civil rights which were enshrined in certain laws which are what we call semi-constitutional because they're not constitutional, they call basic laws. But they wanted to change basic laws by simple majorities of 61. If you have a 61 vote, which is every government has because we have 120 and the majority government is 61, 61 will immediately change the, the, the basic laws and therefore change the constitution and therefore we will be staying without any protections. This is where we're staying. That's why the government proposed that we will have what they call a special clause that will override the, the, the court's decision by 61 votes in the Knesset. And if we'll have 61 votes, we will always be able to override the Supreme Court's decision. People therefore went to the streets. I leave the Israeli system, go back to anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism has been rise for a variety of reasons, as I said and I don't want to enumerate them, you know them very well. In the United States, I think we are in a tag of war of a different nature. There is kind of like a culture war in the United States. We see it today when Trump is being incarcerated, not incarcerated, being indicted today, right? And this is a decision that of course split the, the US. Some people think that uh, this is uh, uh, a drama they cannot, uh, except other thing, this is exactly what supposed to be. But the United States internal war or on, on values or internal war between the Democrats and the Republicans is being conducted when the United States has a very, I would say, large margins of error. You know, even after the events on January 6, uh, 20, uh, 2021, um, you know that the, the United States is not yet collapsing, albeit it's with a very dangerous moment in American history. In Israel, the margins of error are very, very narrow because on the one hand, we are being threatened right now, as everybody in the military suggested, the head of the Mossad, the head of Tishin Bet, the Israeli chief of staff, everybody's saying this is one of the most momentous moments in Israel's security history with, with the immediate and present danger of Iran becoming nuclear, with Hezbollah becoming more and more uh, empowered, with the Palestinians during Ramadan seeing themselves suddenly that Israel is being weakened. So this is our danger. The dangers for the Jews in the United States because of the culture wars and the political war is such that they have been scapegoated sort of like in many ways. 
if it's because the liberals are blaming the supporters of Trump and the, the conservatives for being uh, 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 anti-Jewish or the other way around, when Trump himself and others are blaming the liberal Jews for being too universal, too non-loyal. And all of this is kind of like uh, 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 being channeled to Jewish hatred on many other issues, as you know. Uh, we are therefore in a very particular moment that we have to choose our battles. Israelis will not be able to assist American Jewry right now with the fight against anti-Semitism. I would say that in fact, we become a liability of sorts for the next few months. We hope no, not for too long. And American Jews cannot, being, uh, cannot draw on their sources on, on their uh, 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 leverage in their countries of origin, be it in France or in Britain, on the nature of Israel as a liberal society. Because if Israel is not liberal, and if Israel is becoming problematic in the minds and hearts of Germans or French or uh, Americans and so on, we, there, there is a liability here. They cannot defend it and they can be attacked anti-Semitically by charging that you are supporting a non-democratic entity. This puts a, an, another premium on American Jewish organization. That's why I, this will be my last comment. That's why I think this is a very important time to coalesce, to come together, to understand the challenge, to start to organize priorities, be it involved deeply more in Israel to affect Israel in the same image that you want Israel to be, and or to disengage in a certain fashion and concentrate on jury without state and jury with a state. In the United States, one has to put pay attention to the fact that the forces that has been promoting a judicial review, a, a judicial shift in Israel, have been the conservative forces. The think tanks that have been advancing these laws into the government have been supported by conservative American Jews. I met some, I spoke to them. They think that they've brought conservative values from the United States to Israel because Israel has become too liberal, has becoming too wokeism sort of like, but it's nothing to do like with the United States reality. They have been betting on clerical forces, on religious forces, who, which adopted the language of conservatives in order to see as if there is a symbiotic relation between conservative Americans and religious extremists in Israel. This is a big mistake. I've been talking to some of the American leaders and seeing how this has been used and abused. Some liberal Jews who have not been at all involved are now trying to see this also and getting engaged because they were constantly criticizing Israel on the Palestinian issues. They were concerned about the occupation, all of the above. And many Israelis kind of like saw them as people who are drifting away in any case because of assimilation and did not draw on their power. So there is kind of like an understanding that if the Jews are so divided and are so, um, uh, um, I would say, uh, people who cannot find any common denominator, their vulnerabilities is increasing. So the vulnerabilities of anti-Semitism abroad and vulnerabilities of hostility toward Israel domestically will be increasing in the near future. Now, we had the United States supporting us for all those years we had a shift in government in Britain, which we, we, we are happy. And there were others fighting anti-Semitism in Europe for a long time. Right now, we think that this can be a liability if we don't put our house in order very quickly and project Israel as a democratic and liberal state, which will empower us again. ISGAP, I think, has a very important role to play, Charles, in doing so. Not only fighting anti-Semitism, as you've always done abroad, but also having a voice and speaking up about these dangers and about these challenges in Israel domestic affairs. So I'll stop here, and if there are questions, I will be delighted to answer. Okay, Yossi, thank you for your assessment, uh, a sobering assessment. These are very serious times on the eve of uh, Pesach, where we celebrate uh, our, our freedom and our- Absolutely. Uh, our renew our entry into to Israel. Um,
becoming a people and coming to our land. So my so I, I really appreciate your your assessment, and I usually focus on sort of socioeconomic and cultural processes. But I want to ask you, I guess, a question that comes to mind about the political situation. Um, I think agree or disagree with all the past leaders of, of Israel, the prime ministers of Israel from Begin to, to Rabin, I assume that they always, coming from different ideological perspectives, they always put the state of Israel first, in my opinion, even though they were coming from different perspectives. Netanyahu has a long history of serving Israel from the military to government. Yeah, and my question is, what is he doing? Ultimately, he must know that the people that he's in bed with are not putting Israel first. I mean, when Smoltrich gives a, a, a lecture in front of a map, he unilaterally overturns Israeli foreign policy. And ben Gvir now is going to get his uh, sort of a militia. When do you think that Netanyahu is capable of? I don't know, reaching towards the center to his more natural allies, or is he just trying to put his own personal interests and perhaps his his uh, legal issues before the state of Israel? What, is there any hope that he'll take a turn, or what, what's your assessment of the next few weeks? Is there any hope that Netanyahu will become more rational? It's very difficult to um, to predict. I think that he himself um, initially saw so the victory that uh, he won on the electoral level as a mandate to do almost anything he wants um, under the banner of, um, of majority rule, they wanted to shift the whole legal system. Also his partners in this business, people who are quite extremists in their hostility toward judicial activism, have basically told him that once we do so, we will be able to govern without interruption, especially because he feels himself perhaps a victim of a legal system, which is investigating him and charging him for corruption. So everything is entangled. The point is, I don't think that he could see this kind of avalanche. I think he miscalculated. The first thing he wanted to do is to assemble a coalition, a winning coalition that really will empower him Interesting enough, the, all the members of the coalition did not have any other candidate to, for the prime minister. That's why he was incredibly powerful. But on the other side of the opposition, there were at least two major candidates for the prime ministership, and they were not united. So he wanted to translate this. He also understand the gravity of the demography that basically will allow him to have endless victories, because as I described, this is where the voters are coming from. I don't think he could foresee this evolution. Uh, now he's caught because well, whether we compromise and how much, the, will the coalition members will desert him? And if they desert him and the government collapses, will he be more even vulnerable to the charges of the, uh, um, the, the uh, judicial system that he has to face and, and to go to court? So we are in a quagmire where personal interests and national interests have been entangled. Uh, many people are talking in other terms of kind of like power corrupts and total power corrupts totally. Keep in mind that we are talking here about someone who is in power for over 15 years in a role now, with an exception of a year and a half of, a, uh, of addition and another government. So um, I cannot tell you. I think that uh, people have seen what is happening. Netanyahu always sort of himself as someone who is building the startup nation and so on and so forth, how could we allow this kind of to collapse so quickly? There's lots of debates here on a personal level, on a family level, with the wife and the kid and so on and so forth. So many things have been written about it. Um, um, whether he is capable of ex taking uh, the decisions that need to be taken, people don't know. Um, I think that, uh, he took a step back now. We hope that things will somehow work themselves out. I don't know. I cannot predict. I, uh, I've been uh, seeing this process uh, going in a spiral and deteriorating very fast, much faster than anyone could 
have imagined. And I uh, hope that uh, he has it in him, but I doubt he does. And we will have to see how this unfolds. I cannot give you a good answer, as you can see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I mean, on, on a positive side, it's incredible that more than 10% of the Israeli adult population went out onto the streets to defend their their understanding absolutely, of democracy absolutely. in in a peaceful in a peaceful manner that was absolutely impressive. and there are many you have to understand also there are many in Netanyahu's camp who consider uh, the demonstrations against Netanyahu as people are trying to hijack what they regard as their victory in the election one has to understand what is at stake here people who win the democratic election perceive the democratic majority as a license to change constitutional arrangements, while well, countries that have constitutional arrangement understand that constitutional arrangements are predating almost the state, what we call uh, natural rights, what we call rights that were given to persons, to people in, in the state of nature, so to speak, on which a constitution is being built, and then the democracy start to grow. We don't have a bill of rights like that. And if we do, it can be nullified by 61 votes of the coalition. That's the danger. So under the banner of legality, which is supposed to give the legitimacy to Netanyahu, they can basically destroy the legitimacy of rights. And that is the very, very important issue here to understand. The constitutional nature of the state is in danger because people thinking that majority rule is what allows the government to govern, including racist laws. Serious. Okay, so we have Daniel Statsky, and then Philip, and then Daniel Pelly. And anybody else who has a question, please raise your electronic hand. So Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, what I would like to say uh, is this. Um, I would um, like to very much remind ourselves, talking about the judicial reform, Somehow the debate in Israel and outside has been hijacked, I would say, by political preferences. We all, without an exception, look at the debate now through the prism of our own political preferences and the perceived preferences of our adversaries. The debate really, at the core of it, really, is not about um, so much whether there is a you know needs that there needs to be a reform, but about something else. That's how it started. It's now almost forgotten. Um, Professor Shine, in in the beginning, you said that uh, you wanted to remind us about the three um, pillars of government: the um, the Knesset, the actual cabinet, and then the court. And the core principle that organizes that, it's these, these three pillars are completely independent of each other. So they control each other. They never mix. We have absolute clarity how Knesset evolves. People elect it. We have absolute clarity about how the cabinet evolves. Okay, Cabinet evolves kind of from the Knesset. These people are taken from the Knesset, then they're replaced by others. And at that point, the connection between them is severed. Knesset makes the law. Government is the Arshut HaMivatsa. They, they implement it. Nobody can tell, as far as I, nobody I spoke to at any level would ever explain to me, how do judges make it in to be judges? How are they elected? What is that process? Both the Knesset and the cabinet can be traced to the population, to the process of election, not the judges. The, the suggestion by the um, governing, by, the, by, by Knesset today to cancel the procedure, the, the, effectively to abolish the, the Supreme Court by the majority of 61 is stupid because it violates the basic principle of independence of authorities. It's stupid, and it indicates to me that they haven't done their homework. <laughs> what they should have been um, um, focusing is insisting on an answer. Who appoints the judges? And that's the core point. The accusation that originally formed the basis 
for, for the situation today was that this process is not transparent. It is. Because ju judge, so judges, that, that's me, so, 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 just, just a second. So that you will be able to explain. That's, that's the yeah, explanation. I, 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 I will have to go that soon. Process, to that yeah. process that has not been covered at all, not in this it, debate it, and not in print, been, is the key uh, question. Everything else is, I'd say, um, secondary, in a way superficial. If there is a clear understanding of how judges arise, so to speak, from the population, and whether there is a reasonable weight to the accusation that it's basically a system where haver me vi haver. There okay. is nothing. Th no, there has to be an explanation along these lines. We and have that is basically my, yeah. um, the end of my comments. I will look. There's lots of talk. I've been sitting on the judicial committee and trying to create the basic laws and so on. The Netanyahu's government, under the Minister of Justice, Gidon Saar, and previously to that, Ayelet Shaked, Netanyahu's government for nine years have changed the nature of the rules of the game. And these are the rules of the game, and I will explain they're very clear. Very clear. There is a committee to select judges in Israel built on what? Two Supreme Court judges, two members of the government, including the Minister of Justice and another minister selected by the government, two members of the Knesset, one from the opposition and one from the coalition, and two members of the Bar Association. This is the committee. Of this committee, in order to select a judge, you need a vast majority of seven. They all have to agree. Now, it's not a perfect selected committee, whatever it is. People have argued for years that this committee may be tilted because of coalition between the judges and the court and the people from the Bar Association. But keep in mind that out of the 15 judges selected to the Supreme Court, 10 were selected in the nine years by the government of Netanyahu, among whom three judges who are settlers, three judges who are religious people, yes, and one judge which they brought from the United States, Mr. Stein, a conservative, Israeli, former Israeli, who taught in the United States and was perceived by Ella Chaked as a conservative. So these are the rules. One can change the rules. One can say we can do this, we can do that. But there is a rhetoric out there that chaver me vi chaver, as you said, that the judge brings a judge. That has been not the case. The Supreme Court judges, which had upper hand until 2004, have long lost it because there is a legacy of the Aaron Barak court. Aaron Barak, the judge who was creating this notion of a judicial activism was brought to power by Menachem Begin. Menachem Begin who brought to Aaron Barak as the attorney general and was the one who put Aaron Barak at the seat of the government for the first time in history, had the idea that the freedom of citizens is not well protected. And he wanted to empower even more so the Supreme Court. And under the Likud government, the Supreme Court was enshrined with two basic laws, two basic laws of 1992 that were, were enshrined by the Likud party that accepted them. And this was the basic law, Kvoda Adam Vecheruto, the honor of man and his freedom, and Chofesh the, Isuk, the, the, the freedom of employment. These were all done by Meridor, who was the Minister of Justice under Menachem Begin. Lots of rhetoric has been ever since. And what I was saying is, sorry that I stopped you because I will have to go soon. I have to do some charts. I promised my son I will babysit for him today. <laughs> and this is a very prime, uh, uh, I would say, uh, role that I have for my granddaughter. I would say there is a lot of rhetoric out there. The key factor is not how the the, the, the judges will be just elected, is the demography of Israel. Many people, for good or ill reasons, consider the very identity of the state as a modern liberal state as 
and inimical to their life preferences. This is the key. That's why Israelis were awakened. The idea was a legal shift, but basically the idea was, how do we live our life? If you think, for example, the 61 members of Knesset should rule, that the ultra orthodox men should never go to the army. That's what they wanted to do, Gafni and Golknoff right now. Because if they do so, the Supreme Court can never issue an injunction that said that we are having to deal with the question of egalitarian uh, behavior in society. The role of egalitarian in society that everybody should enroll will be completely thrown out of the window. And for the first time, the issue will not brought, be brought into the, the fore anymore of the Knesset. And that is a big challenge. If, for example, we have taken parties in Israeli system, you talked about the people. Who are the people? We have parties in the Israeli system that are Shas or the Aduta Torah. These are parties that are now almost having 20 seats in the parliament, and the other extreme right will have another 12 seats or 14 now. Do not have any women in their midst, and saying that women cannot run by their legal right, they don't have to run in the Knesset, so they don't have women anymore. What you will do then? Many people petitioned the court and said, can such parties run for elections while inhibiting the participation of women as members of Knesset? Because there are no members of Knesset on the ultra orthodox and they're growing. These are the big issues. The question of how you appoint judges become a supreme issue for the government because they know that once they control how we appoint judge, judges, and especially the chief justice, that they will appoint him directly and not by seniority as it is right now, he or she, those who will be appointed, can arrange any discussion of the court on such constitutional issues and therefore will change the nature of the state forever. This is the big issue. To claim that the judges have been controlling the court, I think is part of the rhetoric because it has long been has long been uh, 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 changed by the, by the government. And in fact, as I suggested, most of the judges today were elected, most, 10 out of 15 were elected by the Likud Netanyahu government who defended in 2012 and 2014, the surrender and say the separation of power is the most important subject in Israel. Look at the speeches, suddenly he changes tunes because of charges against him and the whole thing collapsed. This is the reality and not the idea of the imbalance of selecting judges as if a member bring member. They can no longer do so. Look just at the makeup of the court. Okay, Yossi, thanks. How, how much more time do you have? It's 11 o'clock here. I will uh, have a few minutes and I have to go after that. I, I regret okay. because no I problem. am already uh, uh, can. Okay, so what I would like to do is call on Daniel, Philip, and Shelley. Can you please, I'll give you 30 seconds each. We'll collect three questions and Yossi can answer as he wishes. Okay, so, so Philip, the floor is yours. Please be concise and brief. Sorry, you're muted, Philip. Had to find my mute button. Okay, cool. okay. Uh, number one, I'm a Zionist, period. Number two, there's the, uh, if you will, uh, a very simple kind of guy, liberal versus conservative uh, tug of war. Um, where the states has, I, I can't see a body in the states right now that has not been corrupted already, uh, going up to the courts to the tune of that um, Trump is being assaulted. Can you please uh, ask a question to uh, okay. Yossi's um, topic? The, uh, I thought that the government usually sets the laws where the courts enforce them. Um, the perception is this is not the case in the, uh, in Israel either, uh, or in the States, as things evolved and something had to happen. Okay, thank you, well, Philip. Uh, the, idea of, the idea of judicial review has been created in the United States with Murbury. Judicial review is a key factor, whether you legislate, including in our state, because there is a court also that has to deal with Israel's control of the West Bank, for example, when there is no, it's, it's under sort of like a, a, a Israel rule, but not part of Israel's state. So there's lots of in, in, intricacies, but judicial review is a major issue. The government perhaps stepped its bounds sometime on judicial review. I wrote a book about the language of corruption, Israel's moral culture, that I think the government should not control every involvement 
on issue of appointing, for example, in government because of morality. I don't think the, the court should have the upper morality say because morality is decided in the society. But there are many issues here of judicial review that needs to be addressed. And we have lots of issues like that. Yeah, Daniel, very concise, please. Sure. Thank you. So my question is, uh, do the economic and security risks that have been so uh, unambiguously laid out, um, are they having any influence on the uh, more extreme elements of the current government? I don't think so. I think zero. The, I don't know yet if it's zero, but the, the Minister of the Treasury is now Mr. Smotrich. He refused to accept the verdict of economists. He thinks that this is, you know, like almost a childish like. And now I think he comes to smell the, 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 the results of that. They were trying to attack the central banking decision to raise even interest rates by saying, you know, how could you do so? They were trying to uh, uh, erase issues of professionalism in the economist, but he will, he will have to, Netanyahu sees it, and he will have to see it because with uh, the decline of Israel GDP per capita, people are now saying the reports of the treasury that we're going to miss out, out of 155 billion a year in Israel's GDP per capita that rose to $50,000 per capita last year will deteriorate in two years to 40 and then to 37 in, in, the, in, the, in the range of 40 years. This will be but, devastating and they will not be able to withstand it. But are these just really religious zealots that are concerned by yeah. matters other than e economy and security? They, they have faith in God and they, they don't care about Can these we... kind of reports. They look, they will have to face it. They're serving in the government. They see it. Everybody will see it. They were trying somehow to, to, to detour against them, saying that this is only the kind of like the, the Ashkenazi elites or this elite or that elite or kind of rhetoric, which is also being uh, interjected into because of Mizrahi and Sephardic Jews as if there is kind of an elite controlling the, cover, the government. But I think they will see the results of the economy, which are you cannot really cheat too many at, for too long. And we will see what will happen. They didn't think that people will take their money out. They didn't think that the uh, the, the uh, high tech business will go out. Yesterday was a warning by the the head of Mobileye, the guy who is the richest guy who did an exit uh, for fifteen billion dollars, and say, you know, we'll have to take Mobileye out of the country. And people suddenly walk out and say, wow, look what's going on. People are being fired and so on. They will have to wake up quickly. This is evolving so quickly that they have not been able to see the results of the last quarter even on their table yet. So thank, very, you. thank you. Shelley, the final comment question, please be brief. Yeah, two super quick questions. One is at one point you mentioned that the government uh, could become semi-authoritarian. Uh, semi My question is, what does semi actually mean in this context? But the second question quickly is voices from the outside, from diaspora uh, regarding anti-Semitism and Israel today. Uh, yesterday, the National Post published 400 names, signatories, uh, voicing their concerns about Israel. I'm concerned uh, as to whether or not voices from the outside matter and in what way and how. Uh, I've been reluctant to get involved, not sure which way to go. Semi, I mean, I, semi I mean that we may still have elections, but the elections will not be telling the whole story because under the banner of majority rule, if you can erase legal protections of rights, this becoming semi-autocratic. And the question is how, may, how quickly it will deteriorate into autocratic. S second question for the diaspora. I think everybody should raise their voice, speak up. We're entangled. We are now celebrating Passover. Am Israel is sitting next to the Seder table. We know what happened to us when we were in bondage in Egypt. We know what happened to us. We were in the exile without sovereignty. We should not sit quiet. We should speak up. We should state our mind with whatever your mind is, because our freedom and our chirut and our uh, uh, liberty has been always in the minds and hearts of the Jews, whether they're in the diaspora and in and sovereign life. And therefore, I will wish you all happy Passover. Chag chirut sameach. And I must for my granddaughter, because I, I took the oath of, <laughs> of babysitting, which is the highest oath of the, of the state. And I, I absolutely thank you for your attention. And Charles will find another time to discuss this matter, I'm sure, soon. Yeah. This is I look forward to speaking. And Yossi, thank thanks you. for being here. Enjoy your granddaughter. Really, hug some to you and hug your family. Some okay. And to everybody listening, uh, the next lecture is April the 25th. It's Lev Topper. 
And in the meanwhile, have a wonderful Passover and Hak Sameach. Stay well. Just a second before you okay. leave. Before We're going to meet you, I want you to see my gorgeous hey. daughter. <laughs> Hello. Hello. This Hak is Sameach. Hak Sameach. Say Hak Sameach. I told them I have to babysit. They didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank Ciao. you. Enjoy your holidays, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.